Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this uh, Green Fleet Roundtable Road to Zero here in sunny Rotherham. Am I allowed to say that? He's done a bit more when he, when he announced it. Okay. Because with half of our fleet not being suitable for a for EV or the, uh, without anything being there, full, full stop, that we could still operate. Um, we have got an extra five years. Uh, won't stop us from his original plan of let's try and decarbonise what we can. But it does give a bit of breathing space and it allows manufacturers as well to sort of get a wriggle on really to bring something to market that is suitable for utilities. I think, and this is just a view, I have nothing to back this up, I think the type of vehicles you're talking about, I think it will help that. I think that's, because they've still got these interim targets that they've got to meet up to 2030 those haven't changed so 80 percent of manufacturers vehicles have still got to be mm. fully electric up to that point i think yeah. the bracket that you're talking about is the thing that will just get a little bit more breathing space but yeah our suppliers were just like one of them said and i won't name which company it was if he'd have said 2050 it wouldn't have made any difference to us we're, we're doing this mm -hmm. and it's kind of done and it's not 2030 for them as i said in my opening bit it's 2027, 2028, that's when they're gone. So, yeah. Interesting. Okay. I mean, from a local authority point of view, and again, it's just a view, is the delay might actually give some chance to, for the government to consider giving some more money to local authorities to drive the change you know, to drive the transition, to make your local authorities, your municipal authorities, be the figureheads, the, the, the cheerleaders for it. Something we've done in Nottingham, if we want to have a carbon neutral city by 2028, we've got to lead by example. Hence, 40 odd percent of our fleet is ULEV. But I think the government's got to understand that they've got to help fund that. Um, I think you're right, what you said there, that the manufacturers, they don't make any difference to them, they're doing this, they've got to do it, they're mandated to do it, if not they're going to get big fines from the European Union, irrespective of what the UK government think, um, it, it, it will help in some ways because it might stretch your money and it might also give some manufacturers the chance to catch up or develop better, newer product. I think as a standpoint for a government, I think it's a pretty poor impression to give about the state of the world and our sort of um, uh, ambitions to, to, you know, decarbonise just, you know, uh, road vehicles in general. But as you quite rightly say, I think also if you consider the improvements in vehicles, uh, charging infrastructure, both public, private, and the way that we're able to operate these sorts of things, the improvements will come in like tenfold. We've got um, some charges in for National Grid that they are, they have a shelf life of 10 years um, and they're saying that we installed them in 2021 to start with so they're looking at a 2031 replacement but they already know that they're not going to keep up with them they just won't be able to replace them straight away because the cars will be too capable they wouldn't charge fast enough so they're going to have to think again sort of two three years what are we going to do in 2031 so you are going to have to kind of keep up with what the manufacturers are doing, what the vehicles are doing. But I think ultimately, in sort of business senses, in terms of people that are running commercial fleets, I don't think it makes too much difference. I just think it's a fairly poor impression to give, to be honest. That said, as you say, if it gives the room for improvement to be able to encapsulate a wider fleet perspective across the country, then that, that may be a benefit. But um, ultimately, I think it will make next to no difference. From the direct decarbonisation of road transport and particularly the fleet sector it makes no difference whatsoever battery electric vehicles are, are here they're coming even in the van world they're evolving very quickly as a colleague over here has just said in the car world we're already there um, whatever your use case is pretty much there is an electric car that will that will do it maybe towing a caravan up to scotland and back it's, it's the one exception in the car world at the moment but even that is coming uh, will be with us very so shortly so from the point of view of the take-up of battery electric cars, certainly, that will be...
push, well, it's now mandated to be 80% as it always was by 2030. I suspect actually it'll be more than that by 2030 because why on earth would you buy something with a clunky old engine in it that you have to pay a fortune to charge up, <laughs> to fill up every time? The battery electric cars will be so good by then that everyone, will, anyone buying a new car will, will be wanting one. So I don't think it makes a lot of difference to the uptake of the market. Where I think it might have two negative consequences is one is kind of business confidence and investment and, and the UK being seen to be even more of a basket case internationally than it was already. And what does that do for inward investment and gigafactories and vehicle manufacturing and you know the kind of wider UK PLC piece I'm, I would be a bit nervous about. Uh, and the other is, is outside of the fleet world, the, the private consumer. Um, if you read the wrong sorts of new pa newspapers, you thought that in 2029, December the 31st, someone's going to knock on your door and take your petrol or diesel car away and force you to go out and get an electric, because that's what the sorts of messages that people are being told. That was never the case, uh, and it still isn't the case. But um, I, I think this, this kind of messaging and the way it's been sold in the media it, it kind of feeds into that that narrative that oh, for thank God for that I can I can I, I don't need to change my car now until 2034 or 2035. Mm. Actually, you didn't need to change your car then anyway. It was only ever if you're buying a new car, your options are becoming more and more limited. But as I say, I think the options you'd want are are narrowing down anyway. Um, yeah, <coughs> that, that was the, I think my my reaction to the, the announcements. As I say, the Z mandate from a point of view of the manufacturers is much more important. That, that that sets the trajectory, how what proportion of their fleet they've got to sell that has to be zero emission by certain dates. Um, and the announcement came out was less than a week after the Prime Minister had spoken, was effectively no change. So there's some slight tweaking to the numbers for vans, no change at all for cars. For, for your, your standard, particularly commercial fleet operators, because I think cars have now largely sorted themselves, uh, for, for commercial fleet operators, um, the cost modelling is, is obviously key. Um, now, you know, the, there's a lot of talk about cost of ownership and, uh, you know, the, the price of, you know, electric vans being far more than, you know, uh, your petrol diesel price equivalents. Um, we are reaching a, a state of parity. Uh, you know, we were talking about the, the new e-transit on the way up, you know, I think the on the road net of VAT and, and discounts and grants and, and whatever, uh, it's only a couple of grand different to the, the ICE equivalent. Um, so financially, I think we're sort of getting there, um, but it's, it's everything that comes that comes with that, the infrastructure support, uh, the infrastructure that's required at, at, at your depots, you know, the, the challenges with charging, and, and you know, I'm sure Ashley can give it a, a bit of insight in, into that. Um, you know, so financially, I think, Depending on on the fleet operation uh, and, and, the, and the mileages that your vans are doing, you know, everybody's different. You know, there, there's local authorities. You know, Andy mentioned he's got vans that are doing 20 miles a day, relatively straightforward transition. You know, the, the vans will cost the same. The running costs are probably not dissimilar now between you know electric and and, and, uh, and running diesel. Um, so I think it, we're in, a, in quite a good place now. Yeah, I can give you some figures actually on the car usage. So between January and September of this year, we spent £4,700 on electricity to run the cars, and that was uh, ramping up from the start of the year with mostly FEVs through to 50% EV by the end of September. If I compared September this year's fuel cost with September last year's fuel costs, it's £4,000 reduction in one month. So I spent £4,700 in nine months, and one month I saved £4,000. So the cost, really, of the car is paid for just by using your depot charges. Mm. Your depot charges is essential to it yeah. for the cheaper cost. That, that's key, isn't it? To the, the, the business case is completely dependent, whereas diesel or hydrogen or anything else, there's kind of a fixed price and it varies a little bit. Yeah. You know, go to a motorway services, it will be 10% higher, but it's all the same yeah. price. With electricity, it can be anything from 80, 90 per kilowatt hour at public charger to, to free if, if you've got on-site solar and that kind yeah. of stuff. So, uh, or indeed, actually, you can be paid for the electricity if yeah. you get the right time of use tariffs and things. So. The, it's that huge range, which I think is part of the the jigsaw that people have to work. <laughs> the bigger challenge really as well is, is yeah. if you want rapid charges. So we're quite happy with a slow seven kilowatt. Most cars are parked up for all day, a few hours. They don't need to be rapid charged. 
One depot alone is going to cost £140,000 to be able to put a rapid charger in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Multiply that by 10. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of money. We are getting close to cost parity on the vehicles when you take into account the cost of the fuel. Um, but someone said, or a couple of people said, it's the volatility on the fuel prices that is making or breaking this whole business case at the moment. And that's volatility in terms of the price of the diesel, and it's volatility in terms of the price of the electricity. Um, and coming back to your comment, Alan, that you, you were fortunate enough, and I'm sure the energy procurement manager will say it was absolute insight and I knew the market was going to go. Um, but whatever, you know, kudos. Mr Putin was on the phone to me, told me what... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, if, if, if you can fix your energy costs, if you can fix your electricity costs for a three or four year period so that it aligns with your vehicle fleet or your vehicle purchase, that takes away that uncertainty, doesn't it? It does. It, it definitely doesn't help with TCO because you know you've, you your models change all the time, not just with fuel but because of electric as well. You know, yeah. what are you trying exactly. to model it on? Um, British British Gas, one of our customers, and um, they had quite a comprehensive, or, you know, pretty complex TCO model, but it it they couldn't get diesel. They couldn't get electric vans to be cheaper than diesel vans, even when diesel was expensive, unless they charged them at home. So the public network instantly changes that payback. You know, and it's it's hard, right? Because fuel you can roughly go, yeah, between a pound and one twenty or whatever it might be. Even supermarket to um motorway. But you know, like you said, it's like free or a pound, you know. <laughs> or, you know, a home is typically, you know, 30p, 7.5p if you're on a smart tariff. When we're talking about total cost of ownership, and particularly with electric vehicles and payback, you know, versus ICE, you know, we're, we're looking at extended leases and customers are often asking us now, you know, will we, do, will we go to seven years, eight years on, on electric vehicles? Because, you know, they're, I suppose, I suppose sort of considered to, to have a better longevity. Uh, with certainly with service and maintenance, less moving parts and so on. Um, but but I guess the trade-off with that is you commit to a seven, eight-year lease on an electric vehicle to get your rentals down, your total cost down. But of course, that takes away the opportunity to to take advantage of newer technology. And as we were saying, you know, batteries are you know the sizes are coming like that, and, and the ranges are going like that. Um, I, I just yeah, interested to know what your what your take is on on extended leases for for electric vehicles. Is that something that you've looked at? We sort of looked at what's the battery warranty? Seven years to yeah. get you eighty percent. Mm -hmm. Well, even with eighty percent, it'll deliver what we need it to do. Okay. So we, we sort of went, well, well, let's extend the lifespan of our replacement cycle mm -hmm. to, say, nine years. Because we still do yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. And, and it, it still worked, because, you know, from a local authority. Mm. We have, we have motorised wheelbarrows. Wow. It doesn't matter what I put in. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to look nice. It doesn't matter what it is. It's a tool. It's a wheelbarrow. It's a, it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter what the badge it is. Will it carry half a tonne? Can three people get in it? Will it get from A to B? Will it do the job? I don't care what it looks like. No, really. no. Will it fall to bits? That's what I care about. What's it cut? You know, so... But we sort of looked at it and said, well, there's less moving parts, there's less to go wrong, we've yeah. got that warranty, it'll still do it. Let's extend the lifespan. Presumably, if you don't think that's sufficient, then a seven-year lease probably wouldn't appear to be able to use it much because you're... You know, you're sort of on the whole sort of, you know, batteries, shrinking mages. I mean. Yeah, so when it came to the cars, people are used to changing the cars every three years. And the, yeah. the best way of getting buy-in is all that's different is what's powering your vehicle. Yeah. Um, so that, that was the first thing. When it came to the vans, and another reason we've held back, you, you're quite right, technology's changing that quick. There might be something on the market today that will just about do it if we change processes and nudge it a little bit. Yeah. Why would I want to commit to three years of that at least? Um, when in two years' time there might be something that'll do seven years worth of work for me. Yeah. So this yeah. is it's a really tight balancing act to get it right. When do you make the jump? Exactly. Yeah. Do you jump? Yeah. When do you? Yeah. We 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 jump. Uh, enough. 
not yeah. when it's yeah. Yeah. good. So yeah. once mm -hmm. once you've got a vehicle that is good enough, yeah. which is what which is what we've got, it, we've got, it will stay good enough. enough. Yeah. You, know, yeah. you can yeah. use it for as long as you want to use it for, it, as long as it stays good enough. And it, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's as you say, if, if the vehicles that don't exist, don't yeah. yet exist are good enough, yeah. then you can have to wait. And but we mentioned public charging. charging for, there will be. We mentioned public charging for commercial vehicles earlier. Our perspective. The commercial vehicle needs to do a full day. I don't want my drivers to be sat at public charging, whether it's for 20 minutes, half an hour, 45 minutes. That's time that they're not delivering to the customer. Yeah. Mm. The commercial vehicle needs to last all day and do the job that it's there to do. We've got um, a very small number of electric vehicles and we have no home charging at all. We've just got everything charged in depots. We've um, cards to back up if they were not charged or there was some range anxiety so they could deal up elsewhere. And is that your vision for the entire fleet? <clears throat> um, I don't really know because we haven't got the infrastructure in the depots yet. I mean, not even so far ahead of where we are. If we had that kind of infrastructure, I think that we would looking at, be looking at a similar type model mm. where we would just have the cards as backup. But in Cumbria, I don't know. I don't know how many years it would take us to get to where you guys are. So Come to the Lake District in the electric vehicle and see how far you get. It's absolutely <laughs> you read, yeah, no, it charging. Yeah. It's just going up the hill that's a problem. It's okay when you get to the top and come back to that. I mean, just going back to our fleet, we've, we've sort of taken in, what's coming into our fleet is our housing stock, our housing team spans. That's 293 vehicles. They've got an ambition, the, the housing services team, for these to be EV. But 90 odd percent of those guys take the vans home at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So we're interested in Ashley's <laughs> product there for the yeah, home charge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but, it, but, but it's convincing, it's convincing their management mm -hmm. that that's the way they want to go because they come up with the well, you guys are lucky you've got all your charges in the depot. Mm. Our vans go home. So we're trying to sell that mm. from a from a corporate fleet. We're trying to educate them and bring them up, up to speed and say, look, you can do this, you can do this. There are ways of around it. You, but you've those, probably got those a higher, are... the, higher, the higher level of problem. Your, your, your problem or the challenge you've overcome was, was getting a connection to the grid. Grid was there, you just needed to connect your depots to it. You, you're probably similar to Cornwall places like that. Yeah. You haven't got the grid. Yeah, no, the grid easy. isn't strong enough already, so you've got to you've got to wait for the grid to be ready before you can go full full on on the on the depot connections. All of our vehicles are home based. We have our own start, so we're looking more towards um, the home charging mm -hmm. set up. Um, we are installing what what we did. What we wanted, we went out to our workforce to those who could have an EV vehicle um, and we sort of went to them and we just said you know you advise us what your anxiety is about going to EV we want really much about the vehicle other than the rage anxiety but the biggest feedback that we had from drivers was how do I refuel really it because at the minute I've got an all-star car I can go to any petrol station and fill it up with diesel but what do we do to charge it and because we cover from say like Barnes Loop to Berwick on Tweed up across to Carlisle and Cumbria um, each geographical area is completely different to the next one. You know, some areas are really good. Leeds would be a prime example. Bradford's even better. But they all live in Terry Stanzas in Bradford, so it's it's really difficult. So yeah, we're sort of trying to cover all bases. So we've got we're going to try and get home charging, um, depot charging. Yeah, really low, seven kilowatts, and then probably rely on public charging as well. Especially the van fleets. Yeah, we've done this open reach one of our customers and he learned so much from them because exactly the same situation vans return to home start every day you know and i don't know who said it now but you know we don't want they don't want the vehicles stopping in public at all so they've taken the cards off them completely because they've said if you give them a card it'll just be an excuse to stop yeah <laughs> and then you know i don't know if anyone's got unionized fleets but the union got involved uh, and they said, well, you can't ask them to charge on the lunch break because yeah. that's a part of the working day. So mm. then it adds that they're having an hour's lunch and then an hour charging. And then, yeah. you know, whereas home takes all that away.
But what we have done is where we've had to specify home charges, we've made sure that they're like um, basically click on, click off. So you pay, f you take the hit of the, the cable in the infrastructure, you know, your, your breakers, etc., and a back plate, but the unit itself is easily removable. So if that employee leaves, you have it in writing that you just remove that mm -hmm. and they're left with completely safe, isolated cable and breakers and whatever else they can isolate it if they so choose, but you retain the unit. Um, and that seems to be, because otherwise I can understand where you're coming from. If you install something that is an all-in-one unit, you're going to have to turn up with drills, screwdrivers and whatever else and try and take it off this bloke wall. And if it's been a fairly acrimonious parting of the way, should we say, you're going to have an interesting time doing that. So, um, yeah, we've tried to make things um, as simple as possible. What about funding for charging infrastructure? Um, you know, is, is this common now? Because, you know, from what I've heard is a lot of um, mobility service providers offer funding solutions, but the fleets don't take them up very regularly. Yeah, we offer uh, a leasing program where we're able to, you can essentially turn a, a CapEx into an OpEx, sometimes for, for different budgets, for the way um, your company operates. That can be a really helpful tool because you can essentially wrap it up into a monthly cost rather than having it as, as you mentioned earlier, a massive CapEx expenditure right at the very beginning. Um, and you can turn that into essentially a cost of operation as opposed to um, a capital expenditure right at the very beginning. Can that um, include bringing power to site as well? Yeah, yeah. So there, there are percentages to it. Um, the last time I looked, it was uh, uh, you were allowed to, so you can account for the total cost of the assets, so the hardware itself, mm -hmm. and a certain amount of the install and a certain amount of the operation, so like the back office provision, etc., like SIMs and things like that. Um, but you can't account for all of it. So there is a, a sort of upfront, but if you consider that like a deposit on a lease for a vehicle, it's very, very similar. Um, and then you have uh, monthly, weekly, however you want to lay it out, uh, cost for those units. Um, and what we tend to do is we tend to wrap that out. Again, I can't remember if I said it too earlier, but we tend to offer our maintenance support, um, help desk provision uh, for three years because that's the warranty that our charges have. So essentially you're covered for the length of the warranty. Everything's done um, in a kind of wrap round service. And the lease, we do the same for exactly the same reason. What you don't want to be doing, I think, um, we're all familiar with. You know, when you lease, a, when you a PCP a vehicle, what you don't want to be doing is still paying for it when it's out of warranty, because you potentially could still be paying your monthly fee for a vehicle that is exponentially damaged, and you you've got to pay for it as well. So, um, yeah, we tend to wrap that whole thing up into three. There are options, of course, to extend it depending on how much how much of um, how great the sort of infrastructure rollout is you're talking about. Three years may not be enough to spread it out. Um, so you may choose to take extended warranties or into extended agreements, extended support agreements so that you are covered bar any sort of parts values. Um, but leasing, I, I think like like anything else really, um, is becoming a bit of, uh, it, it will be a way that businesses sort of circumnavigate that massive capex cost initially it's a bit like what we do with most of our things like smart tech and things like that where we spread it out over a monthly basis to make it more comfortable businesses can do the same thing to save um that huge outlay right at the very beginning so um, obviously at the end you use the smart tech example at, yeah at the end of that lease then do i get a iphone 16 instead of a so that's it yeah so with the idea <laughs> yeah i get where you're coming from so the yeah. uh, the idea is obviously Part of the cost, part of the uh, the OPEX that we've now turned from to OPEX from CAPEX becomes uh, the infrastructure, right? Um, and if you've been down the sort of charging road of, of a wider scale, um, you know, Kay said earlier that in a home charging environment, it's about 50-50 charger to install. Yeah. Once you get on a larger scale, like your, your £140,000 example earlier, um, the likelihood is that for a new Dano connection, all the civils, all your electrical works, etc., and the charger it might be a hundred thousand pounds worth of enabling costs and a forty grand unit. Yeah. So the idea would be that you get to the end of that lease and then you decide. Actually, we see the benefit of this. The, the you know the uh, the business case is X. So we're just going to cap X a new unit. And you just replace that unit right. and buy a new one, or right. you enter into a new lease agreement for a new unit and yeah. the other one. I, uh, yeah, th there's an arrangement whether we take that away or you deploy somewhere else because ultimately there's the option for both. It's usually 
proprietary providers. You know, so they've been able to strip out a lot of the functionality that OCPP requires. So it's got less components, mm -hmm. it's got less communications ability, <coughs> um, which is why it's cheaper. But usually that means the back office that they're selling is also their own back office. Mm. So you can't add units from different manufacturers. Um, you usually have to rely on them for the servicing. Yep. So you can't say, I'm not very happy with that servicing agreement, I'm going to go somewhere else, because no one else can touch it, no one else has the parts, no one else knows what to do with it. Yeah. And I've definitely, because things are maturing now, and we are, you know, believe it or not, you know, 10 plus years in, I'm definitely coming across fleets that are saying, we're ripping it all out and starting again. Yeah. And it's for some, it's not because the, well, the hardware has failed, but it's because they're not able to maintain it or repair it in a timely fashion. Yeah. You can't have, no. a, you know, three or four units out of action for weeks on end when you're oper offering a critical service. Thank you, Alan. And on the home side, mm. you're also agnostic. <coughs> yeah, as, you know, we're essentially a back office for home, but we are not a back office, just to put it. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So we can work with any, pretty much any home charger that you can you can install. You know, it's, it's the trap, if you like, of OCPP is worse in home because there are more providers that are vertically integrated. So think of it a bit like yeah. you know, this: you cannot change the software on your phone; you're stuck with it. Um, but you can buy a Dell laptop, an HP laptop, and put Windows on it. You know, it's kind of that that kind of thinking. Uh, you know, but I, I suppose just on installing home infrastructure, I know you spoke about. You know, I presume it's like easy. You know, where you can like rip them. It's rip, very similar, rip, yeah. Rip, rip, rip the stuff out. Um, but I think people or companies necessarily don't necessarily look at the true payback of a home charger. You know, it's a thousand pounds, <coughs> give or take, to install a home charger compared to tens of thousands potentially in a depot. But if you don't install that home charger, you've either got to then install depot charging or you've got to go out in public. If you go out in public, you're spending double the cost, you've got downtime, you know, engineering fleet, you've got hours that you need. We've seen models where a home charger, a thousand pound home charger will pay back in two months or less. So is it even really worth ripping it off the wall? Just put it in and, you know, leave it. So that's just my, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, um, you know, and I think financing home charges, there's tons of companies trying to figure out the models. The biggest challenge is, you know, you they're trying to recover the cost probably too quick because it gets to the same point. What if they leave the company? What if, um, you know, they move house? You know, it just seems like most companies are turning to buy the charger when it comes to home. Getting people more on side earlier, because it is, it is a challenge sometimes getting people on your side. So maybe have a, a better message. We try hard to explain what we're trying to achieve and support our carbon neutral ambition for 2028. But there's, there's, there's quite a few people who are focused on the day-to-day. -day. Mm. They, they want to look day-to-day -day and it's just maybe just involving those people a little bit more and doing a bit more education. Uh, but regrets <laughs> from it? None really. I think it's just we've ploughed ahead and got on with it. So. And people should expect that mistakes will be made. You yeah, can't when, be when, a you, when you're really doctors, and, and things you know, happen. You don't yeah. always get it right every time. Yeah. You might buy the wrong vehicle. I think yeah. you bought two or three that's wrong. Right, probably close on a thousand. <laughs> yeah. But no, it's 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 learning. You learn. It's you also it's just all the time. It's a learning. But you learn by making the mistakes. You don't <laughs> try something new. You never learn from it. Um, you know, there's some products are better than others. Sometimes you have to bite the bullet and just have a leap of faith and do it and then make it work afterwards. Mm. It's that engagement with people. It's just having that message and getting more people on board rather. Sometimes we're being a bit bullish and say, there's your man, get on with it. Maybe we should have 
arm round him a bit and yeah, let me do this. And who put their arm round you, Andrew? Why weren't you one of the traditional ones that pushed back and went, no, let's do it the way we've always done it? Ten years ago, I was a bit resistant. Right. And then I had an epiphany. <laughs> did you? Did yeah, it you? just dawned on me. I thought, hang on, this is, you know, you start looking at the numbers and looking at what you want to achieve and everything, and you suddenly think, actually, we can make this work. I'm up for it. I'm up for it. Mm -hmm.